Next question is from Michael Strawn, and he asks, when's the next collaboration? Classified. This has been a topic I've wanted to discuss since the very beginning of my Outlast escapades. The Murkoff accounts, six of the biggest pieces of information Red Barrels has released publicly. Each of these comics discuss a certain event that either happened prior to the Mount Massive incident, during the Mount Massive incident, or after the Templegate incident. In this video, the first comic will be read in its entirety, and afterward I will be discussing every single mystery I'm able to find to uncover the overarching story of the Murkoff Agency. When that's done, I will theorize future events that may take place in Outlast's history. Prepare yourself to be exposed to the nightmarish activities of the putrid corporation we've, as well as in-game characters, been trying to divulge for the past nine years. However, before we get into all these interesting topics, I would like to mention that this video and the five videos that will come after this one will be in collaboration with the YouTuber Rubik's Cube Comics. In Rubik's first video, he will be giving a quality overview of the Murkoff account part one, a look over of the addendum, and his final review of the overall comic book. Make sure to check out his video after watching this one. I have no doubt in my mind that it's going to be incredible. I would like to also give a major shout out to Vanessa Brandy. Without any further ado, I give you the Murkoff account, Deep Searching Issue 1. Outlast the Murkoff Account, Part 1, by J.T. Petty. The transnational Murkoff Corporation tirelessly pushes the frontier of scientific research and development. Partnering with the greatest minds of tomorrow, Murkoff expands the reach of every branch of scientific inquiry, including gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. In the event of mistake or oversight, the Murkoff Insurance and Mitigation Department comes in to minimize economic fallout. Mitigation officers are damage control. They are not here to save lives or help people. They are here to make sure it doesn't cost the company any more than it has to. Paul Marion and Pauline Glick are Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Officers. Location, FBI Field Office. Oh my god, is that blood? Look at all that money. Let me see your hands. I need to keep this hand on my face. Put your fucking hands up. Okay. I need you to arrest me. Holy crap, I can still see out of that eye. Mr. Paul Marion, born in Cincinnati, passed the Ohio State Bar Exam in 1981. No current address, you're claiming responsibility for one count of arson, one kidnapping, and 14 murders. At least 14, there might be more. Yet there's no evidence for any of this. Of course not. That's my job. Location, Murkoff Rehabilitation Center. I'm going to need a little help here. Happy to lend a hand. I hope, Miss Glick, you won't mind talking while you eat. The matter is urgent. Call me Pauline, please, and of course we can talk while I eat. Where do you want to start? With the steak, please. No, I meant... I know what you meant. You want to know where to find Paul Marion before he does any more harm. Yes, more importantly, we need to minimize the fallout from what he's already done. Sounds familiar. More meat, please. We don't know how early his sabotage of the Murkoff Corporation began, so start at the beginning. The beginning, that would be 2008. As soon as we were partnering up, they started calling us the Pauls, Paul Marion and Pauline Glick. Hilarious. Do you remember the Hatbox murders? Of course, what's his name? The Egyptian guy killed all those veterans? Omar, an American. His grandparents were Egyptian. He was born in Newark. They had just found the third body, one Martin Belmont, took them a day to piece him back together. Just like the others, the head was gone. He was a veteran of Iraq, just like the first two victims. A patient at the Spindletop Psychotherapy Clinic at Hatton, Texas. Markov bought Spindletop two years earlier as a part of Blair's Research Through Charity initiative. They had a government contract to help our returning veterans cope with PTSD. The chief psychotherapist there wasn't directly under Murkoff management, so we had to give him the speech. The speech? We're not here to save anybody. The company you work for belongs to a company that belongs to a company that belongs to the Murkoff Corporation. Accidents and lawsuits raise Murkoff's insurance premiums and unnecessary expenses make us sad. We are damage control. We'll help as much as we can. But our bottom line is the bottom line. We're legal mitigation. So your card says. The murdered men were all patients of yours. They were. We'll need to see any notes you have on their therapy sessions. That's impossible. Doctor-patient confidentiality, unless of course you can provide a warrant, like those FBI men did. We will also need any information you gave to the FBI. We may need to uh, shape your testimony. Now hold on a second. Are these Sumerian? 
That's right, Mr. Marion. My patients were damaged while working in the Middle East. Does good to include some Arabic culture to show it's not all war. Who are they? The Apollo demigods given to man to establish civilization and guard against its destruction. Like the Nepal hymn, Genesis 4, quote, The song of God came in unto the daughters of men, their children the mighty man of renown. With animal heads, let's get back on track. Some scholars think so. I like to think it helps our soldiers to see Christian and Islamic myths coming from the same place. Your reports describe experimental therapy, reliving and dissecting the event until it stops hurting. That's where it started, but we began to see negative effects in the therapeutic spiral. Psychological wounds would close, then reopen wider as the therapy continued. Our current method is dream therapy, guided by hypnosis. They can re-experience and release the trauma events subconsciously without a burden to their waking mind. That seems dangerously close to leading the witness. How do you know you're not shaping the patient's memory? The mind knows what it needs. The therapy was remarkably effective. Rates of subconscious abuse plummeted, self-harm and suicidal thoughts were all but eliminated. Sounds great, except for those three homicides. We're going to need to see those consultation transcripts. That's impossible. Get a warrant or talk to the FBI. He stonewalled us, so fuck him and fuck the FBI. We go to a more reliable source. Video surveillance? Sure, the whole place is wired. It's usually Strong Fat who monitors the feeds. Strong Fat? I wish those guys wouldn't call me that. Do the therapists know they are being recorded? Of course not, we're watching them too. And you watched every therapy session? Yes ma'am, making sure nobody gets hurt. Can you show me the victims? This is Martin Belmont, the guy who just got, you know, killed. He was in Afghanistan, I think. Fish in the desert and the insects eating its eyes are embers. But the fish is alive and I'm going to put it in the water I'm carrying, but I, I pick it up and it burns me. That's Priscilla Clark, the second victim. Yeah, she was nice. They had killed the children too, but the, the children aren't really children. They've got animal heads and... If we don't watch them, they'll they'll come in the house and kill all the... And this was the first victim, John Bowers. He was really sad. I think he killed a lot of people over there. Because they, they followed us back. They don't want us... They want our children, the crane, with blood on his beak from, from our heads. He dips his beak and we move like puppets. You said you make sure nobody gets hurt? Yeah, it don't happen often, but this guy, Omar something, he's an okay guy. Just got a lot of stuff to work out. I can't tell them those things are coming in, they move in blood, something that sucks light out, it comes through the walls. Can you describe the thing? No. I want you to try, Omar. Grah! Omar, wake up! When you hear me clap, you will wake! Ah! There's me. You're good at violence. Yeah, I always been big, and I was MP when I was in the army. MP like military police? Yep, they taught me some judo. An egg! It's an egg! Birth in the blood! Every last one of you motherfuckers. We'll need copies of all those sessions. Can I get them as audio files? Sure. You've got a much higher tolerance for crazy than I ever will. It's almost dinner time. Let's go see if we can catch some widows eating dinner. $10,000, but it's cash which you can't file as reimbursement, meaning you won't be taxed on it. Lord knows we need the money, but I wouldn't bet a split nickel that a lawn jockey taking the White House don't take half of it. Yes ma'am, our so-called government certainly is in a sorry state, though if they're going to be evil, we can at least thank god they're idiots. Amen to that. The retroactive arbitration agreement was always Glick's bag. She could have sold dog shit perfume if she wanted to. For 10,000 bucks, this woman gives up the chance at a lawsuit worth a couple million at least. The contract was a brilliant piece of legalese, protected Murkoff entirely, without mentioning the company once. The Apkalu are in their heads. We need to go back to Dr. Claymore's. That was the thing about Paul Marion. He walked around with his head in the clouds, but then he'd make these intuitive leaps. Even he couldn't explain it. It was infuriating, but useful. At least until those initiative leaps took him down a dangerous path. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We went back to Spindletop, where of course we found... I don't think Dr. Claymore is going to be much use anymore. This whole place is on video. We've got the killer. I'm gonna stay here. Well, shit. No video. The whole system got smashed to hell. Yeah, that makes sense. The killer's motivation was the culmination of all the separate sessions, and there was only two people who heard everything every patient said. 
Dr. Claymore and he's not home. Luckily, a well-dressed white woman has a key to every house in the world. Four missing heads, four coolers. Four directors of the compass, Strong Fat was in security. He was setting up their perimeter. I got Priscilla over here, Bowers, Belmont, and a place he's keeping cool for Claymore, meaning he'll be here soon. I'll call a security team. Strong Fat still sleeping with his childhood stuffed animal? Why are the killers always angry toddlers? We might as well start using his real name. Shit's about to go on record. Fine then. Chris Walker. Little pig? Hands on your head! You are- <laughs> Little pig! Huh? Thanks. He's a Murkoff employee. I think he just retired. <laughs> yep, still means we gotta get him out of here and cover up before the cops get here. You strong enough to put those coolers in the trunk? We put Dr. Claymore's head in the last cooler and put all four of them in Omar Abdul Malik's apartment. Pretty flimsy evidence, wise but his name and skin color did the heavy lifting. Omar Abdul Malik was innocent? Well... Location, apartment of Abdul Malik. I don't know about innocent, but he didn't do the hatbox murders. You seem ashamed. I was. I am. So why did you do the work? Was the money that good? No, I mean, the money was great, but the reason I kept doing it. A big part of Murkoff's business in the modern world is pharmaceuticals and gene therapies. My daughter has the same blood disease that killed my wife, extraordinarily rare and uncurable. But Murkoff had an experimental treatment, commercially unavailable. As a Murkoff employee, I had privileged access. So long as I kept my job, they would keep Alice alive. So, Omar Abdul Malik gets charged with four murders, goes to Supermax for life. Chris Walker's not so lucky. Murkoff uses its employees like Indians use a buffalo carcass. Nothing wasted. I'm sure they took good care of him. That was just the thread that unraveled everything. Chris Walker led to Mount Massive, and then from there, then the real opportunities presented themselves. Marion never found out about the technologies we were using at Spindletop, how much further we had gone at Mount Massive. It was almost sad. Marion still thought he was my partner, not my target. To be continued in Outlast the Murkoff account part 2. Before I start discussing hidden means behind each of the pages, I would like to say how much I respect Red Barrels for how much detail they put into Chris Walker's past life. In the main game, Chris is only shown as a dim-witted brute that only has fragments of his original personality. However, if I look at Chris without a biased outlook, he seems like a stereotypical bad guy that only acts to create longevity in the game's plot. I find it quite refreshing to witness such storytelling by a group of developers. It shows a clear passion toward the character and a little bit of personality we never got to see from him in the game. But anyway, enough positive feedback. It's time to discuss the hidden meanings behind the pages. On the second page of the Murkoff account, the writer explains Murkoff and the greatest minds in the scientific field will be explaining inquiries they have gotten, presumably about their scientific research. The source of these inquiries are probably from Murkoff's shareholders, and most likely from the CIA or some branch of the government. The questions that were specifically asked by these anonymous parties are the progress on gene therapy, behavioral psychology, information technology, and medicine. Before reading this comic, I had no idea what either of these scientific concepts were about. Thankfully, we have access to the internet, so I looked them up, and what I found was pretty interesting. Let's start with the first one, gene therapy. Gene therapy is a medical field which focuses on the genetic modification of cells to reproduce a therapeutic effect or the treatment of disease by repairing or reconstructing defective genetic material. Second is behavioral psychology. Behavioral psychology focuses on understanding and modifying individual thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Third is information technology. Information technology is the use of computers to store or retrieve data and information. The fourth and last one is medicine. Medicine is the science and practice of caring for a patient and managing the diagnosis, prognosis, prevention, treatment, or palliation of their injury or disease. Despite the fact that all of these concepts can be used to do great things, Murkoff is surely using these methods to conduct all sorts of inhumane experimentation. For example, everything that happened at Mount Massive Asylum. Gene modification was most likely used to repair dying cells from the morphogenic engine's body manipulation. Behavioral psychology sounds guaranteed to put people in as much mental anguish as seen fit by the experimenter. This obviously needed to happen for the wall rider to manifest. We saw the usage of information technology when we played as Wayland Park, and medicine for treating lasting pain if gene modification was unsuccessful. Everything seems to fall into place, at least where the first game is concerned. 
Just like every big company, shareholders and third-party backers would want to see results on what they were spending their money on. If anyone was to find out the nefarious deeds of Murkoff's experimentation, a certain squad of highly trained professionals would be called out to silence the loose end. On the same page, we are introduced to the concept of the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department, or MIMD. This is where we're introduced to Paul Marion and Pauline Glick, two MIMD agents. All that I know is that each individual agent is required to partner up with one or more individuals during a Murkoff loose end investigation. You can compare them to the men in black. Anyway, let's continue. Paul Marion hops out of a taxi, completely covered in his own blood and with copious amounts of cash. He demands that he needs to be arrested by the security guards inside of an FBI office. It's unknown where he came from and why he's carrying around all that money. After he's arrested, Paul was either taken to the hospital or inside the FBI office. I would stick my money on him being placed inside the FBI building. An FBI agent begins to announce everything he knows about Paul, which, as you might guess, is minimal. Paul is calm and claims he has killed more than 14 people during his time at Murkoff. The agent has a hard time believing this because there is no evidence linking Paul to any of these murders. Presumably these victims were other investigative journalists that have tried to leak top secret Murkoff experiments. We continue on to see Pauline Glick at the Murkoff Rehabilitation Center. I find this to be extremely perplexing. Why would Pauline be at the MRC? Two men approach Pauline to discuss Paul Marion's current betrayal. Presumably these two men are also MIMD agents. I can infer this because one of the men says, more importantly, we need to minimize the fallout from what he's already done. Why would this man find it his responsibility to minimize economic fallout if he wasn't a mitigation officer? Also, Pauline clearly says, sounds familiar, in response. The agents pursue information about Paul Marion's betrayal. Specifically, they wanted to know everything, starting from the beginning of Paul and Pauline's partnership. Pauline obliges and starts at 2008, the year of the Hatbox murders. After arriving at presumably Martin Belmont's residence, Paul and Pauline found the retired veteran completely mangled and ripped apart. Pauline mentions that there were others that were killed similarly, John Bowers and Priscilla Clark. The only connection between the three soldiers was that they were all patients at Spindletop Psychotherapy Clinic. All three veterans are complete mysteries, with no background whatsoever. After figuring out the connection, Paul and Pauline go to Spindletop to question the head psychotherapist, Dr. Claymore. After explaining to the doctor they were Murkoff mitigation officers, Pauline asks if she can acquire any notes relating to the veterans' therapy sessions. Claymore vehemently disagrees and demands to see a warrant for the surrender of that confidential information. Paul quickly changes the topic, but it's useless. After talking with Claymore, they both go to the security room to get copies of the sessions. Through pages 12 to 24, everything is pretty straightforward. If I went through these pages, I would just be reiterating what the narrator already read. However, one thing I found interesting on page 20 is that it flat out said Chris Walker is a Murkoff employee. How he got the position at the company is completely unknown. It's actually pretty ludicrous to think a PTSD-ridden man was able to receive a job of that kind. It's even more strange that he was able to acquire a security surveillance job at Spindletop, the very place he was treated for his PTSD. The timeline is a little jumbled because the comic makes it seem like Chris was working at Spindletop and Murkoff simultaneously. Anyway, on page 24, Pauline makes it clear that her target was Paul Marion. For what reason, we have no idea. There's no evidence to determine if the partnership was specifically made to keep an eye on Paul or if it eventually metamorphosed into the internal investigation. On the same page, something else is mentioned that is of greater pondering. As Pauline is talking to the two mitigation officers, she brings up that Paul never found out about the technologies being used to Spindletop. The same technologies that were quickly instated at Mount Massive Asylum after the Hatbox murders were solved. Take of that as you will, it's open to extreme interpretation and interpret I will. Now that I've uncovered all of the mysteries, it's time for me to discuss my theories based on the questions that were left open. My first theory is about Paul Marion and how he ended up at the FBI office. I hypothesize that Paul, after escaping from his kidnappers, went to his house to grab money. It's possible that he was carrying other forms of currency besides USD, but judging from the picture, it looks like it was only American cash. After grabbing money from his house, he inevitably runs into Pauline. Some type of conversation starts and eventually a fight commences. That would explain why Paul is completely covered in blood and why Pauline is at a rehabilitation center with a broken arm. After Paul escapes the fight, Pauline begins a hot pursuit. Paul, knowing he couldn't be able to outrun Pauline, decides to hide until he's able to hop in a cab. Then he makes a decision to go to an FBI office so Pauline wouldn't be able to murder him. After Pauline realizes this, she makes her way to the rehabilitation center where she informs the Murkoff Insurance Mitigation Department. I believe this theory has a pretty high chance of being true. Besides the evidence I gave during my theory, I have one more piece of proof. Pauline has a motive for trying to kill, or at least capture, Paul. According to her testimony on page 24 of the comic, Paul is her de facto target. I believe this piece of information solidifies this hypothesis. My second theory is about why Chris Walker killed the three patients from Spindletop. I believe the reason why Chris kills his fellow veterans is because he wanted to release them from their mental suffering. Judging the dialogue we read from the three patients, they were enveloped in psychological trauma from their time in the military and from the experimentation done by Dr. Claymore. Since Chris was stationed in the surveillance office, he would have been exposed to his comrades being torn apart by their own mental dilapidation. The mixture of this and his own treatment from Claymore most likely led him to snap and free the veterans from their pain. He probably would have kept doing this, but since Paul and Pauline started to investigate, that shut down his operation of killing at the clinic. Even if the killing started out of kindness, I don't believe that's how they came to a close. 
If we visit page 18, we can clearly see Chris Walker entering his house with a bloody head in the sack. Whose head is in that sack is unknown, but I'm fairly confident that it's not a veteran. I believe after killing his first three victims, he began to see everyone experiencing mental trauma, that giving him the excuse to kill whoever he wanted, or whoever he deemed to be in pain. Sadly, there's no hard evidence for this, only conjecture. However, everything seems to fall into place. My third theory is about how Chris Walker ended up working for Murkoff in Spindletop. After Chris's time fighting in Afghanistan, he went to Spindletop to get treatment for his PTSD. I speculate a while after his treatment commenced, he probably asked Dr. Claymore if he could get a security job at Spindletop. Why they hired him, I have no idea. However, it could have been because Claymore wanted to keep a close eye on Chris specifically. Presumably after a few weeks or months working at Spindletop, he was approached by a Murkoff representative. The representative offered a second security job at an unknown Murkoff premises. The reason why this would occur in the first place is because Spindletop was owned by Murkoff. They would have had tabs on Chris and wanted to know if the experiments were having an effect on him. You might say, isn't that why Claymore gave him the security job in the first place? Well, no, there could have been a multitude of reasons why he gave Chris a job. The hypothetical cause is just too broad to pinpoint. Also, as we've seen, Claymore isn't the type of man to divulge patient confidentiality unless absolutely necessary. This could have engaged Murkoff to give Chris a second job to keep a closer eye on him. Chris, after accepting the opportunity, begins to work there. Eventually, the Hatbox murders start, Pauline and Paul being ordered to solve them. After he tries to cover up all the evidence he could, Chris runs off and kills an unknown person. There isn't really any evidence for this, but just like my second theory, everything seems to fall into place perfectly. My fourth theory is about why Paul was Pauline's target. I believe the reason why Murkoff decided to target Paul is because he was the likeliest person to leak classified information if he ever discovered too much. On page 22, Paul explains he didn't work as a mitigation officer for sick kicks and money. It was to protect his daughter from succumbing to her extremely rare blood disease. Because of this specific sentiment, Murkoff must have wanted him secretly tailed by Pauline, so the possibility of him leaking information was absolute zero. A man with morals would be dangerous for Murkoff's employment. That would explain why he wasn't trusted with top secret information like the advanced technology that were being used at Spindletop and later Mount Massive. This theory doesn't even have conjecture as evidence, it's purely composed of speculation. However, it would make sense if this was the case. My fifth and final theory is about what kind of experiments were happening at Spindletop. Just like past events show, the government and government sanctioned businesses wouldn't hesitate to experiment on soldiers if it were to benefit them in some way. I theorize the experiments done at Spindletop were to advance the Wall Rider project. The mixture of post-traumatic stress disorder and the Apkulu demigod treatments must have been a prerequisite for the morphogenic engine. As we should know from Outlast 1 and 2, the morphogenic engine needs a method of infection to take full effect. In Outlast 1, it was customized video nightmares for each patient, and in Outlast 2, it was mass religious radicalism. It appears that therapeutic sessions done at Spindletop was a coalition of both these experiments. There's just one small problem with this theory. It's never shown nor hinted that the three soldiers at Spindletop were hooked up to the morphogenic engine after the sessions were concluded. I guess it could be because the patients did not hit optimal mechanism requirements. However, we do know of one veteran that was sent in for morphogenic engine testing, and that was Chris Walker. Perhaps Murkoff was waiting for an extreme reaction by one of the patients to make them legible for experimentation, a reaction that Chris certainly portrayed. In my opinion, there is one piece of evidence that solidifies this theory, and that's direct testimony from Pauline Glick. On page 24, she says, Marion never found out about the technologies we were using at Spindletop, how much further we had gone at Mount Massive. That irrefutably implies that the Mount Massive experiments were being partially replicated at Spindletop. There's also the fact that Jeremy Blair bought Spindletop on behalf of Murkoff, the same man that was the overseer at Mount Massive. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope all of you are enjoying the content that I'm creating about Atlast. It takes a lot of time and energy to make videos like this, so I hope you'll forgive my wonky upload schedule. Make sure to stick around for the other five videos in this Murkoff account marathon. If you would like updates on said marathon, make sure to join my Discord. Anyway, I hope all of you have a good rest of your day and always remember to keep asking questions.